Hey, everybody. I'm Spectacular the Silver Stack. I'm here with a guest today, Lee Organs. Tell everybody, please, what you're all about and uh, how we're going to talk about the world economy today. Um, just kind of in a nutshell. Sure. Um, I'm, a, I'm primarily an investor and a businessman. Um, started with the world of finances uh, by mistake uh, when my father's business uh, basically went under when I was 13. And that just, you know, it's like sh it shoved me into the deep waters of uh, working for myself. So I started babysitting, tutoring basketball, painting wood decks, handing out flyers on windshields, anything I can to make some money. Um, by the time I'm 16, I have some money saved up because I'm living at home and, and whatnot. Anyways, um, banker tells me, this is the year 2000, banker tells me, um, Leo, you have money saved up. Why don't you let your money work for you? And I was like, what does that mean? And he introduced me to then the world of mutual funds. It's uh, very similar to like index or uh, ETFs today. And had my parents come into the branch, sign a waiver because I was a minor um, that I can trade equities. And I started investing when I, you know, age of age 16, right after the dot-com bubble started to burst. Um, and then 2008, I uh, it, it more of a, under the uh, uh, the hat of a businessman, I came to America in terms of uh, real estate when America was for sale, basically, and married both the stock market and real estate into uh, my life. And by the time 2016 comes around or 2015, um, I realized that I'm I'm in my 30s. Lots of my friends that are 30s have no idea what the Federal Reserve even is. Uh, how our financial system is built, anything. And I was like, this is shocking. This is surprising. You guys went to university. I only did high school. How is this possible? And therefore I said, I think that there's a big gap here. And if I can just take everything I'm reading and learning and speaking with hedge fund managers and CEOs on a daily basis, and I can put it in a free newsletter and share it with the public, I think they'll, they'll have value. That's how wealthresearchgroup.com uh, uh, was born as a free financial newsletter. And, uh, you know, it's, it's been six years now. So um, that's sort of uh, uh, in a nutshell, like you asked. Perfect. So, I mean, I think everybody right now knows that the uh, uh, financial markets, uh, gold and silver, cryptos, everything is pretty much just really scary right now to get into. And um, if, if you got some knowledge on this, I want to, you know, throw this at you. I'm kind of curious right now, what is the biggest danger in your opinion right now to the financial markets? Uh, what's going on basically? Yeah, I think the biggest danger uh, facing us is that uh, once the CDC in January of 2020 announced that uh, COVID-19 is a global pandemic, the world uh, stopped acting in unison and developed and developing nations separated from each other, Europe, Asia, and the United States separated from each other, and a lot of finger pointing um, from nation to nation. And I think the world hit peak globalization in January of 2020, and we've been deglobalizing for the past two and a half years. And I think we've entered a 40-year, 50-year cycle um, that ends very badly um, in, in terms of deglobalization. I want to just briefly mention how these cycles work. We've been on a on a 70-year globalization cycle since the Marshall Plan right after WW2 um, with the formation of the dollar standard, 1944, the Bretton Woods agreements. And then all, everything that proceeded, if you put on uh, uh, your goggles and look at it from the world of globalization, you'll see how it all fits into globalization. Everything, every major event fits into globalization. Um, uh, basically, the dollar is, is a world reserve currency. Um, any war that the United States waged is, uh, uh, you know, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the two Iraqi wars, everything was under the guise of globalizing the world. Uh, many Americans criticize it. Other people think it was a stabilizer event, a peaceful event. Uh, other Americans say, we don't know why we're fighting for. It, it creates all sorts of uh, huge debates, huge um, internal conflict, but still it was all based off of that. And the major one was going to China, convincing the Chinese 
to take 500 million rice farmers that all they knew how to do was plant fields and urbanize them. And that really was the, the main engine of, of globalization in the last 30, 35, 40 years. In 2011, the, this labor pool, this half a billion people, human labor pool, exhausted itself. And for the past 10 years, we've been on fumes for this globalization because uh, as you see right now, we have a labor shortage and it's not coincidental. P people who have tracked globalization for the past 40 years have known that this is coming uh, to be. Elon Musk about a year and a half ago already says we have uh, too few working people in the world. He uh, already saw it before it became uh, a major issue. Jeremy Grantham, the, the hedge fund manager who called the super bubble uh, cry, uh, collapsing basically before everybody, um, uh, even as early as December of 2021, said the same thing. And I think we should all understand that before the 70 year prosperity period of globalization, which does have its its victims, right? The middle class of, uh, of America uh, has been a big victim of globalization um, on one hand, but the amount of wealth created on aggregate has been incredible uh, for the world at large and a lot of debt. The globalization creates debts, um, for, uh, especially for the leading countries. So before that, we were in a 40 year deglobalization between 1910 and 1950. This was the last, uh, 1910 was the last peak globalization, and then it went on to until 1950. Think of what we've had between 1910 and 1950. You had the formation of the Federal Reserve in 1913. You had World War One between uh, 1914 and 1918. You had a big recession in the United States in 1920, and a change to the gold standard. Then you had the Roaring Twenties, a Great Depression, the rise of Hitler, WW2, and uh, the destruction of Europe. So. And, and nuclear bombs on on uh, on, a, on in real life, not as an experience. So I think people should really understand deglobalization from 2020 until 2040, 50, 60, 70, whenever it, it ends uh, in some sort of a problem, uh, we are deglobalizing. National borders are going to shut. You saw that first with Trump and, and the border walls. Um, you saw it during the pandemic with. Uh, uh, incredible lines of trucks uh, outside of uh, borders like France and Italy, borders that are wide open, but yet they were not. Um, uh, and so I think that people should understand that. Before that, uh, think about this. You had a, a globalization period between the 1870s and the 1910s. Edison, the Wright brothers, the cars, all these amazing inventions, oil becoming popularized, this all happened during the, that globalization period. Before that, the deglobalization period were the uh, Napoleon Wars, uh, civil war in the United States. I mean, deglobalization is very destabilizing and the war between Russia and Ukraine is just the starting gun uh, of this period. So um, if, if you think about the world in that context, and understand that that's what we've entered, um, then everything that's, that is happening right now makes way more sense to you. I say that this could be a very bad thing for a lot of countries. You know, maybe some countries like uh, like an America, maybe even like a Russia or a China, they could probably get along, you know, by themselves. You know, if we're we're deglobalizing, uh, we're reliant on our on ourselves and China's reliance on themselves because it's a large country. There's a lot, lot they can, you know, go ahead and do there with the land, but some countries are really going to get left behind if this right here becomes a uh, reality in the near future, uh, the deglobalization. Um, is that, is that kind of like how you're, how you're seeing it? Like some countries are just going to be like really bad off. Um, the, the two most important countries are obviously the United States and China. Um, and what happens in, in the relation between them is gonna set the tone for, for everything else. Um, if we can see the trade and the dependence between China and the United States basically forcing them to stay in this, in this bad marriage uh, instead of uh, a, a full divorce, then uh, we will have fewer problems. But if China or the United States 
make moves that are uh, right now seen as far-fetched, but might happen, then I think other countries uh, will be the, the collateral damage. Uh, Russia is not a country that, that has a robust and complex and diversified economy um, where they can stand on their own. That's, that's why they invaded uh, the Ukraine uh, for coal and oil and, and natural gas. Um, the United States is definitely the most diverse and uh, the most advanced economy in the world. China cannot d- uh, depend on itself. Well, it can, but it goes back to the 90s. If, if China has to do things on their own, um, with the way that they are dependent on United States technology right now and the amount of uh, just intellectual property that they buy from the United States, they're going back 40 years. So um, definitely the United States is top dog uh, in, in everything that has to do with intelligence, technology, and um, everything that has to do with high tech. Um, and China is the rising star, but it can go wrong for them if um, if they act in, in a way that's politically um, not the right way. All of these sanctions towards Russia are basically uh, uh, a way for, for Americans to say, China, look at what can happen. Look at how fast globalization can go away if you do the same thing uh, the Russians did with the Ukraine, if you do the same thing with Taiwan. Uh, we will all ally uh, against you and, and whatnot. This is a, this is a, a war without a declaration of war. This is America and, and China right now fighting, and Russia is basically the example of what can happen. It's, this is already very destabilizing. That's why you see uh, the Treasury bonds having their worst year since 1887. Treasury bonds have had their the first half of this year was the first H1 of a calendar year since the year 1887. At one point, the stock market at, was on path to have its worst year since 1932, then 1962, and it ended up, it ended up being the worst year since 1970. So, uh, I mean, we're we're discounting so much in the stock market right now because we're we're literally resetting so much. We're resetting the idea that zero interest rates will stay with us because they won't. We're uh, discounting uh, monetary policy staying dovish. In other words, the central banks monetizing. Treasury bonds, that's not going to happen. Um, we're discounting for recession. We're discounting for uh, more layoffs. And we're discounting for valuations. So all of that is being priced in to the way we're acting. And, and you started your uh, your intro to this interview to say everything is scary. Um, and it's true. But if you look at, uh, and I know we'll get to probably to gold, but just to give you an idea, gold is down like 2 or 3% this year. For, for any asset class to be down like only two or 3%, that's a real achievement. Um, so I, I actually love the way that gold is performing in 2022 compared to uh, other things. It, it is offering a phenomenal hedge uh, this year. Um, so, okay. And, and just to, to give you a more broad context of this, I created a very nice special report with lots of graphs and charts and uh, that obviously is hard to get into in, in such a quick interview, but if you go to wealthresearchgroup.com forward slash pain, like P-A-I-N, forward slash rug, like rug bull, R-U-G, and forward slash 1111, I think those three reports, if you download them over this July 4th weekend and you know, spend some time on them, understand where we are, you'll realize that we are, we have left um, the last paradigm, and we've entered a very different paradigm. This is going to be a very different decade. Your standard of living will be impacted with, by things that you've never thought are possible in America, like gas prices being unaffordable, food prices being out there like crazy out there, shelves being empty as Americans. That, that's like unheard of. Um, and I think that you will see these things linger with us for the next two, three, four years until companies are able to build their supply chains again. And that's that's something that Americans are not accustomed to. And it's going to lead to political changes and economic changes and opportunities and distress. 
you know, one of the things that uh, when I meet people who were from other countries, um, I ask them like, hey, what's different? What, what did you see in your country versus like things over here? And one of the first things they always talk about are the uh, the supermarkets, the grocery stores, how there's just aisles of different items. Yeah. And, you know, and you're talking now about that going away. Yes, it's going to be very uh, eye opening for Americans. We've seen that, you know, through the pandemic, but um, I guess it's not going to stop. Uh, it's, you know, and every, we see this trickle effect every so often of, you know, oh, there's a shortage of uh, milk, there's a shortage of this, there's a shortage of that. And it's like, what is next? Like, how many more shortages can we take? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's scary out there. But I, I want to ask you uh, short term and then like a long term on this stuff right here. Our money, like what do we do here? Like uh, what's I'm what's trying to read your notebook? And I, oh, okay. Money. OK. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> Just a sign. Okay. Uh, but yeah, what's what's uh, you know, if, if this is happening, if the de- globalization is going on, um, you know, what's because our dollar is really kind of dependent on other countries, you know, uh, yeah. what's what's going to happen to the dollar? Is it just going to be worthless? Um, no, I, I, I don't think um, we need to go there. It's, it's not going to be worthless. And um, uh, it's, it's actually trading at the 21 year high right now. So let me, t- let me break your, your question down to two. Uh, first of all, if you look at the last deglobalization period, we had the roaring twenties, they ended up with the great depression. And then um, if you include dividends, it took us eight years to go back to the 1932 highs. If you don't include dividends, it took 17 years. So I'm not saying that the stock market in November peaked for the next eight years here. Um, but what I am saying is, I think that if you're an investor, uh, it, until this bear market is over, I think that indexing, which is what most people do these days, they just normal cost average into the NASDAQ or to the S&P or, or the Dow, I think that's not what you should do. You should focus on companies. Find companies that, uh, or individual stocks is what I mean, uh, and invest in individual stocks that you feel are undervalued, growing, and have a management team that can withstand supply chains, inflation, and, and, and whatnot, all these things. So it, it, very different. In the last decade, you, you can buy the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ is, is compounded 14% a year during the last 13 years, if you were just buying the NASDAQ, you'd perform better than I think 95% of active uh, hedge fund managers out there. You could be a billionaire. If, if all you did was raise money and buy the NASDAQ for 13 years, you'd be a billionaire right now. Uh, if, you, if you knew this in advance, because you'd raise so much money because every year you'd be performing uh, so much better than everyone else. Now we're flipping this equation around. Now the indexes, the indices, are going to perform poorly, but individual companies are going to be uh, doing much better if you can find the right ones. So we're, we're in a bear market, point number one. Point number two, uh, with regards to the short term and the dollar, the dollar right now is a 21-year high because we're li- reliving exactly the same playbook as after the dot-com bubble. If you remember, everyone sold stocks and sold bonds. When you sell, when you sell anything you own, what do you settle your transaction in, you settle in dollars. So if you're selling everything and you're demanding cash, that creates a technical demand for cash for dollars. That creates a squeeze of liquidity on dollars. We saw it in 2001 when the dollar was uh, the strongest it's ever been after the 9-11 when everyone was just panicking. We saw it during the March, April, 2020 when everyone was selling everything, the dollar hit uh, an all time high. Uh, and when I say all-time high, I mean on the DXY compared to other fiat currencies. And we're seeing it today again, when uh, the levels of cash out there are the highest uh, they've been in, in about 35 years. So short term, the dollar is a lot, is very much in demand. Longer term, what we're seeing because of deglobalization is a theory. Um, the most prevalent theory out there is that the dollar is going to lose its reserve currency role altogether, uh, like the, the pound before it. Okay, that's one theory. Um, the way that I look at things, I don't think that that's what's going to happen. I think that in the next 20 years, at some point, China's military budget is going to be larger than America's military budget. Probably their GDP will surpass America's GDP at some point during the next 10 years. And at that point, 
they will start to convince other political leaders in countries like India, Russia, China, I'm sorry, uh, Brazil, uh, Indonesia, Nigeria, countries that are reliant on trade with China, perhaps some European countries um, or Eurasian countries, they will start to talk to them about starting to hold in reserves yuans. And what I think will happen is you'll have exactly what you had during the Cold War. You'll have two blocks. The Eastern Bloc, there will probably be countries that are way more reliant on trade with China and on relations with China. They'll probably own uh, more and more yuans over this period and um, dwindle down on their dollars. And you'll have the Western sphere with uh, the United States and, and the countries that do a lot of business with it. So you'll have sort of a two reserve currencies. Uh, the dollar, obviously, much larger than the yuan, but as we go through the century, they'll they'll go towards evening out, um, and some sort of mechanism, uh, a world bank of sorts that has an exchange ratio between those two reserve currencies. I think that's more likely than the U.S. losing its reserve currency role, because uh, the United States is is such um, is it, such a leader in so many things. And Americans love to self-criticize themselves, um, and, that, and that's fine. But in terms of uh, what's reality, um, it, America is such a leader in so many industries. It's not going away. Its competitive advantages are still intact today. Um, and I think that they will continue to be intact uh, as long as the free enterprise system continues to, to work in America and, and uh, more and more socialism uh, bordering the communism it doesn't uh, trickle to society. If, if America continues to be a banking powerhouse, a technological powerhouse, intelligence, cyber, uh, universities, education, everything that uh, propels America forward, I think that uh, it's most likely that you'll have two blocks. Um, and I, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. As long as there's no real war between China and, and the United States, if all these wars are more of, um, you know, cyber wars or um, other types of uh, currency wars, it, it's much better than obviously phys physical uh, altercations between um, these countries. So short term, the dollar is very strong. I think that this is because of the risk off environment. Once we go into this risk on environment, then I can talk to you about when I think we will start seeing this pivot. I think the dollar will, uh, will weaken. Uh, because people will go back to buying equities and, and, and you know, uh, and that creates less demand for the dollars. And over time, I think the dollar loses the amount of dominance it has today, being 61% of global transactions, and will probably go towards the 50s. Um, but we've, we're, we're already seeing this. It, it, it used to be 72% before the euro. So we're, we are already... Uh, losing reserve currency role at, at a rate of about one to two percent a year of global transactions, but still uh, uh, people turn to the dollar as the most uh, reliable major currency out there, uh, bar none. Absolutely, um, a couple things you mentioned sure. uh, the website Horrible. with the uh, graphs you were working on. Yeah, uh, is it okay if I put uh, that right there in the description of the video? Absolutely, wealthresearchgroup.com uh, forward slash pain forward slash rug forward slash 11. And I think also uh, a very good read is forward slash 2022, which is uh, this economic outlook that I gave for throughout the year. Um, I believe in these special reports, uh, these PDFs, because they're packed with a lot of information, a lot of graphs that most people don't have access to because some of them are come from proprietary sources um, and I make them uh, public. So I think that those are really good sources of education for uh, for the viewers. Now, Leor, if you have you have my information, I, I believe you have it in my email, you can just email me uh, any kind of links you want uh, and I'll, I'll put them down in the description of the video too, because it uh, seems like it's gonna be really helpful to people to just click on those and, and check that information out um, after Absolutely. the video. Um, also, my other question, and you knew it was coming, was going to be this one right here. I'm just going to go ahead and write it down. Uh, gold, baby. Yeah, I love gold. gold. Yeah. I was going to put capital, but then I changed my mind there. Okay, yeah, gold. Yeah. Uh, 
I'm like you. I feel like I've noticed that gold, although it's coming down, it's not coming down like everything else seems to be crashing. It seems mm -hmm. to be coming down, but holding on, you know, for dear life, it's kind of like doing a little bit better, in my opinion, than some of the other investments out there. So mm -hmm. what what should we do about this? Because I still am a firm believer of getting into gold. I think it's still undervalued. But uh, tell me what you're thinking right now when it comes to, um, you know, deglobalization and everything going on. Yeah, deglobalization obviously is is uh, um, something that's beneficial actually for gold, right? Uh, during the last um, deglobalization between 1910 and 1950, uh, gold was revalued up, revalued up again from twenty dollars to thirty five. You probably know the history uh, uh, of FDR better than I do. Um, and then it became like the the peg at thirty five to one in 1944. So deglobalization periods. Uh, in, in those periods, uh, the importance of a global currency diminishes and the importance of a uh, international uh, type monetary system where there's nothing that's national, not, nothing like a dollar or euro or yuan, uh, where there's something that's outside of these. And gold is the perfect uh, uh, example of those become more important. So we're in a very good cycle for gold, uh, in my opinion, in the next 40 years. Um, and I think that what people really need to uh, understand with gold is that what it did in 2022 is prove that it's far superior to Bitcoin. That's one big thing it proved. Bitcoin was born in 2009 and it was born into this, into this world of, of zero interest rates, uh, very dovish central banking, lots of stimulus. So we knew how it worked in that environment, but we don't know how it works in, in this environment. And so gold has proven that it has different characteristics and far less volatility. If you're looking for a hedge, especially if you're big money, I mean, uh, Bitcoin is the worst asset class. It may be amazing in terms of uh, overall returns, but, you know, uh, who wants to spend his life with a machete in the jungle uh, in order to get to a treasure? I'd rather find a highway. And I feel like with gold, I'm sorry, with Bitcoin, you're always inside of some turbulence. And it's very hard to tie a large chunk of your portfolio or net worth to that kind of event uh, or an asset class. Because what if you need the, some of the money? And now it went from 65 to what? 19,000 in, 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 in no time. So if you're pretending like it's a, it's a store of value, you have a problem. If you're saying, hey, Bitcoin to me is like a, a leveraged bet on the NASDAQ, then I get it. Then, then yeah, that's, I, I can see that. I can see how it's, it's leverage on technology, but I just don't see it as a store of value. So uh, if, you, if, if you think about it as a, as a leverage to the NASDAQ, and you're saying, hey, the Nasdaq just had phenomenal 13 years. Then, of course, Bitcoin had unbelievable uh, 13 years. But what happens now? So um, I think that's where my mind is at with Bitcoin. Then uh, compared to stocks and bonds and real estate, I mean, gold is doing exactly what it needs to do. In, in the 21st century, gold has gone from 250 to uh, over 2,000 an ounce. That's a 700% return on money, on money, okay? So this, I don't want you to compare it to productive assets like stocks and, and bonds and real estate, but hey, if we're already comparing them, it's done better than the S&P 500 and better than the NASDAQ for 22 years now. Uh, gold hit a bottom for the cycle in December, 2015 of uh, 1,053 an ounce. I literally created uh, the Wealth Research Group site a day after the Fed announced that it's, it's raising interest rates on December 15th, 2015, that's when we started to create the, the Wealth Research Group site and, and, uh, and the newsletter because I knew that uh, people will not understand that this is like a bottom for gold. Why? Because when the Fed actually raises interest rates, it acknowledges that inflation is a problem. That's why in six out of six rate hike cycles since 1971 until today, every time they raise rates, twice in the 70s, once in the 80s, once in the 90s, once in the 2000s, um, and, and, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, and 
in, in between 2015 and 2018, gold has risen six out of six times with the average appreciation being 30%. So if we're taking the first Fed hike rate uh, in March 15th of this year, and we say from that day, I want to calculate 30%, we get to about 25, 2600 for gold. And that's how I get my price target for this rate hike cycle um, uh, for gold. I think that um, when we look at uh, uh, how history is played out with rate hike cycles, it's very clear gold is a very good asset to own right now. And I think that the best time to buy it is after huge declines. And we had two big declines that took it down to the 1600s. Um, and I think that the opportunity to buy there is, is gone. Uh, in my opinion, the better precious metal right now to own would be silver. Uh, in terms of uh, what it can do in the next year or two. Overall, under the fiat monetary system, uh, gold has done far better than silver. And it, so it's a long-term uh, hold. If you're asking me, hey, what can I buy and never sell? I would say gold. But if you're asking me, what can I buy for the next two, three years? I would say silver. Because since 1971, gold has compounded at 6.7% a year. And silver has only done 3.3%, which is very poor compared to gold. Uh, but on the flip side, when you look at short term inflation bursts, uh, obviously silver does way better. And I think we're entering a, uh, this point here where silver can go on a between a 50 to 70 percent uh, appreciation cycle that takes it to between 30 and 35 an ounce um, as the risk on environment returns. You know, especially if uh, deglobalization is. Uh, coming to fruition here, if, if we're not reliant on other countries, um, our gold supply, our silver supply is going to st really start showing that dwindle much more than ever. Uh, so I, if we're, I agree 100%. Yeah, if we're holding on to that stuff uh, while we're here and whatever country you're in, you're holding on to it, you're probably going to end up on a, a little literal gold mine. Uh, just because of how much value there's going to be, ha you know, because because you can't go just you know and and get some from Russia, you can't go and get some from these other countries. Whatever you got is going to be landlocked, and you're going to have to, you know, have that from that country. It's going to be very expensive, I think, in the near future if uh, if we stop dealing with other countries. If I may just add there, I, I think you've you've hit on a very important point. Um, what's what happens in deglobalization periods? is you have what's called geopolitical capitalism. So instead of going to the cheapest and most effective source to get anything, in other words, if the Chinese are very cheap and very efficient at creating air conditioners, then they should do air conditioners. If they're good at shoes, they should do shoes, etc. cetera. Uh, now you have political issues also coming into the picture and you're saying, no, no, no. I don't want China to dominate copper. Let's find copper here in America, no matter what the cost is. And so if when you live in a world like that, then it makes things more expensive because there's something called the regulation arbitrage. The Chinese care far less about pollution, the environment than uh, Western countries. So if you want to build a gold mine in the United States, you have to comply with this kind of regulation book, whereas in China, it's this kind of regulation book. So it's much, way more expensive. And then there's what's called reclamation costs. It's basically saying, okay, you dig this big hole in the ground. You had your caterpillars here for 20 years. Now we want you to uh, flatten this out and build a nice forest over it like it used to be. And those uh, kind of programs, they cost tens and even uh, hundreds of millions of dollars for some operators, depending on the size of the, uh, of the mine. So when you have those costs attached, yeah, that raises the prices of commodities uh, around the world. And just to give people an idea, in the, in the entire United States, spectacular, how many active lithium mines are in the United States? In the one. United States? Well, yeah, we don't have anything, right? It's all like South America, one. isn't it? There's, there's one. There's one active lithium mine. That's It's actually not even active. It's, it's getting into operations right now. So it, when, it, it makes your mind boggle because you're like, okay, we, we, we sourced from the cheapest sources. We went to Africa for the cobalt. We went 
uh, you know, to the edge of the earth for whatever else. We went to Latin America for lithium. Uh, we went to Australia for the diamonds. I mean, uh, we went everywhere. We and we uh, this allowed it in in many states in the United States. Uh, say for like uh, uh, Nevada, which is a, a gold empire. But uh, I mean, if we're going to uh, become domestically uh, looking at ways to, uh, to source these things, they're going to be more expensive. So yeah, geopolitical capitalism is part of deglobalization. It is happening. Um, and it, 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 when it comes to, to silver and, and whatnot, um, don't be surprised to see a lot of these states that didn't like uh, mining all of a sudden turn to uh, to mining again. Well, there's going to be uh, extra money, and I guarantee that everybody, everybody's going to start digging in their backyard. If there's gold back there, they're going to start digging. Uh, hmm. Listen, this is some really interesting information. I haven't heard this side of it yet, so this is this is uh, kind of new to me, and I, it's a lot to wrap my head around. But um, yeah, I'm going to definitely check out your uh, the link that you uh, told me about, and uh, again, I'll put that down in the description for people. Anything else okay. you want to say um, about this before we go? Yeah, I, I just want to tell people that the markets are going to keep uh, being forward looking. So while you in Main Street are going to feel the deepest and the most painful part of the recession that we're already in, the markets are already going to start to rally. So just understand that uh, because that's the psychology of money in the stock market. You're going to see the most pessimism. And at the same time, the markets are going to start rallying like there's, there's no recession because they're already pricing in nine months and 12 months down the road. Gold will do the same thing. Silver will do the same thing. And that's why it's very hard to time the market. Uh, because the markets are forward-looking and you'd never know how forward-looking they are. So I think the best thing is, it, um, as an investor, look at value and don't look at the timing. Um, and if you're a short-term type of, uh, of trader, then, uh, I mean, you're, you're entering one of the most complex environments ever. I think you should really focus on the long-term. And then if you're a retiree, or approaching retirement, and you cannot play the long game because you want your money to work, but then you also need it a year or two or three down the road. Stick to very short-term lending uh, opportunities where you can lend for a year or two years with eight or ten percent interest, or stick with uh, very uh, high-quality real estate. Stay away from the volatility of markets and, and whatnot because that's uh, that's where you cannot be. Um, looking to play your uh, play with money and then need it at the same time. It's not the way to go. If you have time, like me, if you're if you're, uh, I'm going to be 38 uh, on uh, on July 8th. I have 25 years worth of of buying to do, uh, more buying and buying and buying. So to me, volatility is a friend. But to somebody who's listening to this and he's you know 55 to 65 and he knows that he needs some of that money. Look at ways for you to transition out of the traditional uh, stocks and bonds and also into alternatives like real estate and, 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 uh, uh, and fixed income like lending and whatnot, because you will need that component in your life. Wise words wise words and like i said i haven't heard this side of it before i really appreciate it um and listen hey coming up happy birthday uh thank you big, big three eight <laughs> the, the big three eight yeah I'll, I'll be i'll be the big three nine here uh, about a month after you so i'm looking okay. forward to <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Guys, uh, listen you're welcome to come back anytime because uh, i've never heard this kind of um side to it like i mentioned so it's good to get that 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 information like that so if you have uh, more you ever want to add please um you know we know how to connect to each other and we'll do that um and i would like absolutely. that absolutely right. my pleasure uh leo gantz everybody uh definitely check out that link down in the description um he'll have more information down there for you and um you, you probably want to listen to this um interview a couple of times because there's so much information jam-packed into this thing that uh this is this is really wise information and uh, Leo, I just want to thank you again for, for coming on and giving us this. This right here is uh, really a uh, uh, treasure right here that you provided uh, all this information. So thank you. Thank you. And uh, listen, uh, happy birthday. 
Um, be careful out there. Don't go too crazy, okay? Because you got to be 40 soon. So you don't want to. I'm in Israel. So <laughs> I, I've seen everything. <laughs> I, I can tell you, I can tell you last year in May of 2021, I was sitting in, in this room. And, you know, like right here, there's a window. And I am looking uh, towards south. If you Google map Tel Aviv and you just go on the shore and look south, you will find Gaza. So I was literally sitting here. And at nights, I would see uh, missiles over the city. And then the Iron Dome system, which is like an interception system, finding them uh, in midair. And this was happening like for, for a few nights straight. Um, and what's crazy is once, once there's a ceasefire, the next day people are out at the, at the cafes and, and at the beach. And it's like nothing has happened. So, I mean, we're... We live life here almost, uh, uh, you know, in, in some sort of a weird duality uh, between uh, peace and conflict. So uh, everything about our heads is always thinking uh, and obsessing about risks. You almost live life, uh, live your life as if it's uh, your last day, I guess. Uh, <laughs> yeah. At you air over top, my goodness, that's got to yeah. be scary. Yeah, I, I was like one of the only ones that are on the balcony uh, uh, filming it. You're obviously supposed to be in, a, in the shelter. So, um, but it, it, it was something unique to, to just see for a few, uh, for a few minutes uh, how this well, actually always, happens. I've always wondered if those missile defense systems actually work. So I'm glad that you've seen them so that I, I can feel more confident. They do work. They do work. And, and uh, just as an anecdote, uh, the guy who uh, came up with it, the engineer that came up with it, he struggled with uh, the Ministry of Defense here to get uh, funding for this for like three years. They they didn't believe it was, uh, uh, I would say, ballistically possible to, to do what he proposed, where there are literally hundreds of, of missiles fired at the same time. And this uh, system, it it it. It differentiates between the ones that their trajectory is to an open field or to the sea. So it doesn't even go after them. And it only goes after ones that has a trajectory to populated areas. And it ends up finding like 90% of them, um, which is, you know, pretty amazing. So um, it, 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 to see it in the night skies, it's, it's pretty well. So super amazing. All right. Well, listen, you be careful over there. Um, but, uh, you know, have a happy birthday and thank you for thank coming you. up. Uh, let's do it again sometime. Absolutely. Leor, thank you so much. 